ap atypical and eukaryotic uh, protein kinases. All right, uh, thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to share the latest results in our lab with you today. Uh, it's about the protein kinases. But before moving into the results, I would like to introduce the protein kinase to you. So the protein kinase catalyzes the transfer of phosphate group to, of ATP to a substrate and by doing so, they act as a molecular switches. They turn some processes on or the processes off in cells. They also play a central role in cell signaling and diseases like cancer. They are currently one of the major drug targets, along with um, GPCRs and ion channels. They form roughly 40% of the human drug targets. And there are currently 50 FDA-approved small molecules on the market, as you can see from this figure. Uh, the protein kinases are frequently mutated, especially uh, in diseases like cancer. Um, I believe P3K is the most mutated gene in cancer. And they are typically involved in therapy resistance. Oh, sorry. Uh, the kinase inhibitors are known to bind to several kinases. Uh, this is because of the ATP binding site. It's really highly conserved, which make it, makes it almost impossible for a kinase inhibitor to bind, to inhibit only a single protein kinase and none of the rest. In our group, we are really interested in both the eukaryotic and atypical protein kinases. And for those who are not familiar with, the, with that uh, nomenclature, I'll explain it in a, in a few slides. But we're interested in those two major groups because in the literature it's shown that uh, inhibiting both can uh, contribute to synergy. So, uh, for example, if you look at the uh, pathways here, the systematic overview of the pathways, on the left, we have the yellow one, which is uh, eukaryotic, uh, the BRAF. And on the right, we have the red one, uh, which is atypical, P3K. So inhibiting just the BRAF one um, doesn't decrease the network efficiency, really. However, inhibiting P3K does decrease the network uh, efficiency quite significantly, but it still doesn't go to uh, zero. It's only when you inhibit both pathway that the network efficiency really goes to zero. So the cell doesn't, doesn't have any uh, response to that. Um, <clears throat> and in order to analyze all the uh, kinase data, uh, mainly structural data, we developed the CLIPS database. Uh, it's a structural database designed to systematically analyze all protein kinases, their inhibitors, inhibitor interactions, and more. Uh, the database currently covers almost 300 kinases. Those are the ones with the structure. Uh, the whole kin kinome is around 555, I think it was the latest. Uh, we cover two species and almost 5,000 structures at the moment. Uh, the database is fully automated, including uh, stuff like the GFG motif. Uh, it's online, it's freely available. Um, and always up to date. So uh, the PDB releases on Wednesday the new uh, structures. It is quite likely that there will be also kinases in there. So if you go to the database tomorrow, you'll probably see the newest structures released in the PDB already there. Uh, so once a structure is released, it comes to the database. It gets aligned to the existing CLIS alignment. And then we annotate. 85 residues in the binding site. This is just for the convenience of comparing the kinases. For example, the gatekeeper, which is on position 45, you'll find it on that position in all the kinases in database. 
Uh, the DFG motif is on position 81 to 83, and again, you'll find it in all positions. Uh, you'll find it in all kinases uh, in the database. So you can very easily generate plots like this where you can see how conserved different motifs are. So this is just an example to show you some of the uh, search options in the database. So you can search by either uh, entering a smile or you can even draw your molecule in there. You can search for identical molecules or substructures, or simi similar molecules. Uh, you can search by group, uh, kinase, back pocket, front pocket, uh, DFG motif, and stuff like structural property, ligand property, interactions with specific residues, uh, composition of the binding sites, etc. Uh, Cliffs is also integrated in the NIME work, uh, platform, which makes it very easy to do complicated workflow without any programming needed. So this is basically click and drop uh, of nodes in here, and you just press, uh, press run, and it will run the, uh, the workflow for you. You don't have to do any uh, uh, programming yourself. For example, here we get all the DFG out ligands, so these are the ligands that target inactive kinases. Then we filter from those the ones that bind to a specific pocket in the back, and here we have the, uh, the results. We can also calculate the fingerprints of those ligands with the RD key node, uh, and we can also calculate molecular descriptors for those uh, just by dropping uh, a, a node in here. And again, you don't have to do any programming. And oh, uh, I forgot to say, you can even do way more advanced stuff. You can do machine learning in Lime. Uh, you can do even docking in Lime. Uh, it's, it's, it's really complex. Uh, the classification that we use in Cliffs is the one that Manning uses. Uh, so the eukaryotic protein kinase represent nine groups. So here from AGC till TK and TKL, those are the, ATP, uh, the eukaryotic, sorry. Uh, example is EGFR. And we have the atypical ones. Uh, example would be mTOR and P3K. So they're called atypical because on sequence level, they are really different from the eukaryotic ones. However, structurally, the lipid kinases and the protein kinase like are really similar to the eukaryotic ones. So for example, if you look at this uh, 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 figure, you can see the, the G-rich loop, the linker, the alpha C, the beta sheets on top, they are all present here as well. Uh, a small group of the atypicals really has very different structure and very different sequence, and those cannot be aligned uh, to the eukaryotic ones. So I wouldn't show all the analysis that we did. I'll just focus on the ligands for this presentation. So first we start with um, the autosteric ligands and their binding sites. Here you see an overview of all of the uh, orthostatic ligands currently uh, solved in 3D structures of uh, eukaryotic protein kinase. So as you can see, they target both the front, the back pockets, uh, the gate area, even some cryptic, uh, cryptic uh, pockets here. While the atypical ligands target much less of an area, there is currently not a single atypical ligand that targets, for example, the back pockets of the protein kinase. However, they do target some uh, uh, pockets here behind the G-rich loop, which are really selective for the uh, atypical kinase, and they don't occur in the eukaryotic kinases. Um, so the CLIFS database is designed to uh, provide you with insights into inhibitor binding. Um, you can look at residues, binding pockets, interactions. So here we have staurosporin in two different kinases, and you can compare how it binds the interaction it makes. For example, the tryptophan here, it can make only this interaction in the L, uh, atypical kinases because it's rotated towards the pocket only in the atypical kinases, and in all eukaryotic kinases, it's rotated towards outside of the pocket, so it's impossible to make the interaction. 
And here we have two other examples of inhibitors targeting the PA3K uh, isoforms, alpha and beta in this case. So, uh, for example, uh, alpilisib targets um, uh, PA3K alpha and makes these hydrogen bond interactions with the residue on position 55 here on the alpha day helix, while the SAR inhibitor makes, re targets really nicely the pocket here between the lysine and the tryptophan, which is uh, again uh, present only in the atypical kinases. We further analyze the allosteric ligands as well. Uh, however, CLIFS is designed for the uh, orthosteric binding site, so the, so the ATP binding site. So um, you cannot do this systematically in CLIFS. However, the data is there, so you can download it and make plots like this, uh, plots like this yourself. So here we see eight hydrophobic uh, eight, uh, uh, binding sites for the eukaryotic ligands and four for the atypical ligands. We also looked at the hydrophobic spines. Those are really important motifs that hold the whole uh, um, fold of the protein kinase together. So previously, Taylor and Cornell found those motifs, those, those hydrophobic spines. And uh, uh, we see that they're indeed conserved in the protein kinases. For example, if you look at the interactions between the residues of those motifs, they are almost always there in all the structures inside of the binding site. However, outside of the binding site, we, found, we find some differences. For example, the alpha F helix that's present, for example, in EGFR, and I think pretty much every eukaryotic kinase is missing in the atypical kinases. So those two residues here that form the lower part of the C-spine are not present in the uh, atypical kinases. Uh, however, we found other residues that are roughly in the same area and they are hydrophobic, so we think that they fulfill the same fun uh, function as those uh, in the eukaryotic kinases. And <clears throat> one of the difficulties that we have when we're working with the protein kinase and the uh, activity data is that uh, when um, it's typically that the matrices are very sparse. So, for example, if we're interested in, let's say, 10 or 20 inhibitors and, let's say, uh, 10 kinases, it's almost certainly that we wouldn't, we wouldn't find all the activity data points for all those combinations. So, if it's 10 by 10, it means that we wouldn't find 100 activity data points for each possible combination. Typically, we find like 2 3% of the matrix field or maybe sometimes 5%. So we will be missing a lot of information there. So we designed this workflow to help us come up with some ideas about inhibitors and their activity across the kinome. Uh, so in this case, we used Cambo. We downloaded uh, 85,000 activity data points after doing some filtering initially. Uh, we ended up with almost 90 uh, unique protein kinase and a bit over 52,000 compounds. We split the data in training, validation, and test set. We used 10% uh, for the validation and test sets. And then we prepared the ligands uh, by using the uh, molecular fingerprints. And we prepared the structures, the kinases, uh, by using actually the, the 3D structure of the binding site. So really the 3D structure instead of, a, let's say, a fingerprint or 1D uh, something. And then this was provided as input for a, a three-dimensional convolutional neural network. Uh, so the three convolutional neural networks works as uh, follow. I mean the convolutional and the uh, uh, max pooling layers. We download all the binding sites from CLIS, which are aligned, and then we put them in, a, let's say, a box like this, where we split the atom types, the carbon, uh, nitrogen, and oxygen, in different channels. You don't want to put those three 
in the same box because you have to give them, let's say, a different uh, value. For example, nitrogen will be two and carbon will be one, which will make the algorithm think that nitrogen is more than carbon, which is uh, not the case. So we split them in three uh, different channels. Um, this is very similar to what they do with images, for example, with the convolutional neural networks where they split an image into three channels, red, blue, and green. So this is exactly the same, but just with atom types. And this we provide as input for the convolutional neural network, uh, along with the uh, inhibitors. So the nice thing about this is that the filters here that use a specific kernel of size three by three by three in this case, they can learn the 3D uh, composition of the structure itself uh, rather, again, rather than the, uh, let's say, a fingerprint or something. Uh, so we evaluated the, uh, the convolutional uh, neural network on the, te of, on the uh, almost 9,000 uh, uh, samples that we collected from Cambo, and we found actually really good uh, results. So the RMSE was 0 0.9, the mean absolute error was 0, uh, 0.75. The Spearman correlation was really good. Uh, and uh, RH, uh, the average uh, IOC was uh, 0 0.7. So here you can see the predicted versus the measured uh, locked activity. However, there is one uh, issue here. So on the very low activities, uh, the network cannot predict them very accurately. So some of the very low activities are being predicted as uh, uh, higher than they are, but for the rest, there is a nice correlation, I would say. And there was recently a dream challenge that also did something similar. So they had the inhibitors and the kinases, and the challenge was to predict the activity of those. And the results of the best teams were I would say pretty close to those one. Uh, if not, the RMC was, I think, even the same, exactly. Uh, however, I, I wouldn't compare the two because the test sets are very different. Our test set is 30 times bigger than theirs, but they use more kinase, so they're not comparable. Uh, but the performances was uh, roughly the same. And with that, I would like to acknowledge the uh, people that contributed to this work. Albert Koistra designed the, the, the first cliffs alignment and the uh, uh, database, which we then further developed uh, together. Uh, Chris, uh, Ivan, and Bart supervised the project and uh, provided insights uh, and input. And I thank you all. Questions? Very nice talk, thank you. What resolution was the 3D box that you put the binding site in, um, in terms of each cell, each subcell of that box? Sorry, what? So when you place atoms in the, um, in, in yep. the, presumably there's like a one angstrom or two angstrom or half an angstrom. It was 0 0.2. 0 yep. 0.2, yep. okay. So it was, yeah. Yeah, did you do any augmentations with regarding to shifting things slightly to move them into a different box? Um, uh, yeah, I did, yeah, okay. indeed. I, I tested different, uh, yeah. yeah. <coughs> Thanks. Uh, how did you align the structures for the 3D convolutional network? So the structures are aligned in cliffs. Bo all the structures that we used uh, for the network are aligned in cliffs. So you didn't have the rotational problem? No. Okay. No, we download all the structures directly from Cliffs and they are all aligned there. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Let's thank our speaker again. And last but